Well, the Lal Street ended Friday in the red, but for the week, the Sensex and the Nifty were quite muted, lukewarm, if you'd want to call it that. Um, now we've seen the broader markets underperform as well, with most sectoral indices ending in the red. On today's edition of the Editor's Roundtable, we take stock of the third quarter earnings season, the big downgrades that came in, and we put spotlight on the auto stocks. We decode the Minda pre-call deal, so we're going to talk about lots. I'm Sonia Shanoi. With me, I have my editors, Prashant, Nigel, Nimesh. Folks, it was, uh, you know, an interesting week. Of course, this 18,000 level has become a bit of a pivot point, a bit of a hurdle for the market, but largely so much corporate action happening this week. Well, oh, absolutely, and earnings are behind us now. Yeah. I think that's yeah. a good that's thing. That's finally a relief. Uh, he was a sigh of relief, but absolutely. earnings have not gone in the right direction, right? Yeah. I think that is a worry, really. Let's actually quickly uh, run us, run our viewers through, uh, you know, a couple of points which basically help, uh, you know, get us a sense of what's happening right now. Uh, the mood is actually pretty somber out there, uh, and I think it's been that way for the last couple of weeks since the budget, actually, uh, and uh, no clear sense of direction, uh, and uh, you know, unable to break out of the range as well. So those are the three things uh, which kind of uh, define the market mood. Uh, both local and global queues are also largely unsupportive. Uh, uh, and I'll get to both. So earnings is the number one thing. Uh, so if you take a broad basket of, say, the NSE 500 companies, X of financials, right? Companies uh, have seen X financials, and that's the bulk of it. They've seen profits drop 12% on a year-on-year -year basis. This is uh, broad-based data. And, I'll, uh, and uh, I and Nigel will put more data uh, to this effect a little later. In terms of the global stuff, right? I mean, it's confusing. Uh, data is all good. But is that meant to be a sort of, uh, you know, a good for markets also, or is it meant to be bad for the markets also? And, you know, there the conclusion is flipping. Sometimes it's good, sometimes it's uh, bad. And that's why I'm saying it's a bit uh, confusing. So let's take the help of, uh, you know, what prices are doing really. Uh, so U.S. yields have run up quite a bit, right? I mean, about 50 basis points in the last six or seven trading sessions. I'm talking about the 10-year. The dollar is, uh, the dollar index, a broad measure, is back at 104 which means it's now erased all of its losses this year. It's come back very, very strongly. Uh, so just two things. On the S&P 500, uh, on Thursday, we saw a close below 4,100. It's a 4,100 is a key support level. It's a bit of a battleground area. A weekly close, which is this today, Friday session, a weekly close under it, I think uh, will uh, get a lot of people to wonder whether downsides are opening up. The 10-year, as I said, has already surged quite a bit, but I think if it breaches 3.9 uh, on the upside, you know, uh, it, it would suggest a return to the high of 4.33 from where we saw a massive fall. It's not very far, by the way. Here in India, the Nifty is basically, uh, after, after Friday, uh, fallen within, uh, back in that range. The range is that budget day candle, right? I mean, the high was almost 18,000, the low was 17,350 or so, and we are back within that range uh, once again. Bank Nifty never managed to break out of, the, uh, out of this range like the, uh, like the Nifty. Uh, and that remains uh, kind of range bound. For the 12th session, the Bank Nifty has spent in that 1st of February candle that we saw. It was a very large candle, of course, very large volatile moves, but that's what uh, we've seen both on the Nifty and the Bank Nifty. But uh, Nimesh, uh, you pick up a lot of stuff with your conversations. Uh, you know, what's Prashant, the latest? Actually, I'm not too disappointed with this week's market. If you look at the market, we've been consolidating with a very narrow range. But the good part is uh, there is leadership back in the markets now. So Reliance has, Reliance has helped the bulls, ITC helped, and, and, and finally we saw some you know, moves in the technology stocks as well. So there is clear leadership. That's one part one. The other part is uh, at the margin, the FIs have 10 net buyers for India. Even if you exclude the large block deals, uh, effectively they were net buyers in the cash market, and that was a positive sign according to me. The other important thing, you know, uh, since we had a lot of conferences this week in India, and there was a lot of chatter from the larger FIs as well, the broader context is uh, the India's premium valuation is now added to China uh, for two reasons. One, India has underperformed, and China has seen a big outperform in the last six, eight months. So uh, now the valuation premium is, is, at, is at a 10 year average, which is not bad, which means that you know, the, the, tra the, the tactical trade of India to China is now largely over. That was a key takeaway when I spoke to some large FIs who came to India this week. So that's on the, that's on the positive side. The only sup the supply overhang is going to be a key thing to watch out for. We saw this week large block deals, Coforge 10% equity changing hands, Interglo 4% equity changing hands, and the overall feedback is that trend is likely to continue. So I'm expecting more block deals coming in next week as well. So that's something you know need to track on. But uh, you know, as I said, you know, from, a, from given the global uh, perspective, India is relatively better this week. The other niggling factor apart from supply was the fact that the new margins which came into effect from this week, that is impacting a lot of uh, you know, activity from HNIs and retail investors. That's the overall feedback. I spoke to a lot of brokers as well. So that, I guess, will take some time to stabilize. So that's something to watch out for. 
But at the margin, the FIS of 10 buyers and the fact that uh, India has relatively been, been you know, in that range is not bad, so to speak, given the, given the global perspective. So that way I'm, I'm saying uh, it's not been a bad week for India. Mm. The froth has been taken off, right? I mean, yeah. uh, so maybe maybe a little bit more, but the excesses, the large excesses have been taken off. Let me just, guys, uh, run through the earnings, right? The earnings downgrades which have happened. Let me go across to the big wall as we were talking. Uh, and I think uh, it'll help kind of uh, set the context for this conversation. Uh, so, you know, there have been earnings, earnings downgrades uh, galore, uh, as uh, the title suggests. And just for the purpose of, uh, to explain what we have done, what we've done is we've taken what earnings expectations for F524 were one month back before the earnings season started and how they've moved as earnings have come through. Uh, so one, uh, earnings one month back and earnings now, right? And these are estimates because what markets focus on is earnings surprises or disappointments incrementally. I'll start with the Nifty 50. In the case of Nifty 50, 56% 56 56 of the companies have seen earnings downgrades. That is 28 companies. Uh, five companies have seen no change. Uh, six companies have seen very small change, minor upgrades between 0 and 1%. And 11 companies have seen upgrades. 11 is what, 22% uh, have seen upgrades. So 56% have seen downgrades and 22% have seen upgrades. Now let's quickly tell you where are the upgrades and downgrades falling. I'll start with upgrades, smaller list, banks and financial services, as you can see, some FMCG and auto, Bajaj Auto there. Where are the downgrades? As you can see, it's widespread actually. Divi's Laboratories, Tata Steel, uh, Kotak Bank, Bharti and Apollo Hospitals. This is all, by the way, Bloomberg uh, uh, sort of, you know, uh, best consensus data that we are uh, putting out. So it, it kind of averages out all the uh, uh, extremes. So these are the downgrades on the, the biggest downgrades on the nifty companies. Let's now expand the horizon and uh, basket to NSC 200, right? So you can say this will include some of the best uh, top mid caps, etc. as well. So in the NSC 200 uh, list, we've seen downgrades for 57% of the companies. That's 113 out of 200 companies have seen downgrades. Nine have seen no change. Under 1% upgrades are 19 companies, so as good as nothing. And upgrades by uh, upgrades from 59 companies, not from, but market is upgraded estimates for 59 companies. That is about, what, 30%. So 57% have seen downgrades, 30% have seen upgrades in a wider basket. Again, let's just tell you where the biggest upgrades and downgrades are. Uh, LIC, Bank of India, PSU Banks and Financials is a theme that you will see quite a bit. Bank of India, Canada Bank, IDFC First, and Bajaj FinServ. Actually, this is all financial services where we have seen, at least in the first plate, upgrades from. And then you also seen upgrades from Torrent Power, Tata Power, Petronet LNG, and Indian hotels, uh, uh, sort of, uh, so as to speak. Now, now come to downgrades, where the list actually is long, and it's quite interesting as well. Uh, so, and I've kind of tried to bucket this into uh, thema themes, right? So the new age companies, Zomato, Nika, you can see the downgrades for FI24 estimates, 24 and 23%. Uh, consumer durables, uh, Crompton, Whirlpool, big downgrades. Uh, Dixon, of course, is the poster boy for PLI, manufacturing, etc. That's seen a 15% downgrade. The consumer names, right? High P consumer names. You look at this. ABFRL, Page Industries, United Breweries, InfoEd, Jubilant Foodworks, all 10% and more in terms of downgrades. And then Pharma, Divi's, Laura's, Gland Pharma, Lupin have also seen their earnings expectations move lower. Uh, metals, uh, so some repetition, Tata Steel I mentioned earlier, sale, industrial company like Linde India down 12% uh, to FI24 earnings. And Indus Tower, Bandhan Bank and Z are some of the others which have also seen earnings getting pulled back. To put a comprehensive picture, I zoomed out more. So this is, uh, we talked about Nifty 50, Nifty 200, top 200. This is NSE 500, right? The widest basket. And you can take a look at what's happened here. For non-BFSI companies, that is 422 out of 500 companies, profits are down about 12% on a year-on-year -year basis. But let's get this number for the Nifty as well. Uh, and uh, Nigel has that data, so let me toss it across to him in terms of how expectations have moved there. Nigel, over to you. Okay, all right. Uh, well, uh, Prashant, uh, let's talk about, uh, you know, Motila Loswal note, and they've termed this past earnings as a modest quarter because, uh, you know, autos did pretty well. 
the cyclicals didn't do uh, too well. So let's give you a couple of numbers out there. Now, for the Nifty itself, well, the earnings growth for the past quarter was around 11%. Motilal is working with a growth of close to around 14%. So in that sense, it missed estimates by a bit, little bit. But for the nine months, well, we've had pretty strong mid-teens growth is what we've seen on a year-on-year -year basis. And the profitability, why did it moderate in quarter three? Because banks, financials, they fired. Autos did pretty well. And some of these metal stocks, well, they underperformed. Also, there was a broad-based uh, slowdown that was seen in consumption. Whether it was staples, whether it was discretionary, both of them were a bit of a pain point. Now, the BFSI uh, space, that did very, very well. And X or BFSI, actually, there was a larger than expected decline. Because the decline X or BFSI is to the tune of close to 14%. They were plugging in a, a, you know, a decline of close to around 3%. So that clearly hurt. Now, what does this do to the Nifty EPS? Well, for FY23, they have scaled it back by close to around a percent, not too much out there, scaling it back to 812 rupees from around 820 rupees odd. But they're keeping their targets for FY24 intact. That would mean it's a taller ask. You know, in FY24, you'll need to see a bigger growth out there. And the EPS estimates they're working for for FY24 is close to around 990 rupees odd. So we've got a tall ask actually from here on because the base as well is high up. But let's see how this one goes. Okay, well, you know what? This is, of course, the big theme, right? The earnings downgrades and the bit of disappointment that we've had. Let's go across to our guest, Prashant Kemka, the founder of White Oak Capital Management, is joining in. Uh, Prashant, welcome to the show. Uh, what are your own thoughts on how earnings season has spanned out? Do you see more downgrades and upgrades? And if yes, what are the kind of sectors that you uh, continue to be bullish on post the earnings season? Hi, Sonia. Thanks for having me here on this uh, sure. panel. I mean, thanks for the question. Um, so I think as the uh, chart or the data just showed, uh, yes, a lot of companies outside of BFSI, BFSI had very robust results, but outside of BFSI, there were um, in this quarter a uh, couple of things going on. Uh, see, inflation in raw materials has been coming down, but a lot of the companies had higher priced inventory raw material, which were bought in earlier quarters, which they're working through now. But they, in their end pricing, they have to reflect what is uh, more in line with current raw material prices. Yeah. So the prices have are lower, but RM prices that they're using from the inventory are still higher, and hence there is a margin compression, but that is a one-off margin compression. Mm -hmm. uh, that's what the companies are saying as well, and it should normalize for most of them some point during this fourth quarter or for some companies in the first quarter of next fiscal year. So that's been one of the key reasons for uh, lower earnings for many of these companies. The other reason, more fundamental, yes, there has been some, it seems, some slack in consumption demand, consumer demand. And that's across urban areas as well as rural areas, but maybe a little bit more at the more economy end or the value end. Uh, because the impact of inflationary uh, pressure is felt more at that economy or the value end of the uh, curve. So those two, for those two reasons, earnings have been softer for um, you know different uh, market uh, uh, corporates uh, in in the market. Okay, well, uh, stay on, Prashant. We'll come back to you. There was another big story this week, and it's a deal that we told you was in the works, and it finally happened this week. Auto component major Minda Corp acquired about 15.7% uh, stake in its rival pre-call. Remember, CNBC TV18 had reported earlier in the week that Minda was on the prowl for a stake in pre-call through a reverse book-building exercise, and that happened. Nimesh, you were the one to tell us. But, uh, you know, so much to and fro. Uh, we thought it would be a takeover battle. Yeah. Finally, it's just a, you know, financial stake. But tell us a lot more about what you found out. Well, Sona, it's too early to say it's final, you know. Uh, this is just the first step, according to me. So, in the first step, Minda has acquired 15.7% in rival pre-call. They've paid 400 crore rupees. So, I guess even the Minda investors are going to ask the management on what is the rationale behind it, spending 400 crores for a minority 15% stake in a rival company. So that's something we need to see further. In fact, Minda has gone on record saying that this is just a financial investment and they should be treated as normal investors, what the other shareholders are. But I guess there is a, there is a road ahead for this, uh, this deal, to, to, so to speak. And that's what we'll, we'll have to track very closely. Uh, I was looking at the uh, you know, uh, shareholding pattern of both these companies, Precall and Minda Corp. In Precall, the promoter holding is very low at just 36%. So that's going to be a big <coughs> risk for the, uh, for the Precall promoters. The mutual fund holding is 4%. FI owns close to 12%. And there's a private equity investor who owns 5.7%, which is PHI Capital. And interestingly, that same fund owns 5% in Minda Corp as well. Uh, the disclosure will be important as to you know, who, are the, who are the large funds 
who participated in today's reverse building and given 15% stake to Minda Corp. The next step could be whether they will go and talk to uh, you know pre-call promoters and ask to, to, to buy them out and whether there will be an open offer as well. So that's the second step to watch out for. I guess it's going to be, uh, this is just a start, is yeah. what I understand. Uh, need to see how you know things pan out. But I guess, Sunay, you know, you've tracked the sector so well. Uh, what are the key you know synergies that benefits? Because I was looking at the balance sheet of uh, Mindakov as well. I think they've spent most of the cash that they had in today's 400 crores. Yes. But the fact is, uh, for a 2400 crore market cap, even if to reach to 50, 51%, they need 1200 crores. Mm. Do they have enough cash to fund this and, and take this over? In fact, on their books, Mindacorp mm. has just a little over 300 crores, yeah. which is hard cash on their books. And as you said, you know, I mean, that's not even enough to fund it. True. But given take everything, I guess, from the accruals that came in in Q3, etc., they would have made that amount available. But I think it's a strategic fit for them. Yeah. Eventually, whatever they plan to do with pre-call, whether it's a hostile takeover, whether a complete acquisition, uh, Precall is a very strong company in, uh, you know, these instrument clusters, which are the various displays and indicators that are used in a car. And Precall is the second largest global player mm. in this uh, instrument cluster space. Uh, they also have uh, provide fuel level sensors for two and three wheelers. So it's a very strong business. In the nine months period, the earnings have also picked up quite a bit. It's a debt free company. Not just that, they have a 50% market share in two wheelers. They have a 70% market share in commercial vehicles. They also do various things for electric vehicles. Vehicles, they provide connected vehicle solutions, telematics, onboard navigation. And as we know, you know, this is a space that the Minda Group is very aggressive in, in yeah. this whole EV space. Uh, not just Minda Corp, Uno Minda as well. So in that context, it's a strategic fit for them. Now, uh, you know, there are of course many positives. Precall is has free cash flow of about 100 odd crores. So in a sense, this is a strategic fit so for uh, Minda. What could the merge entity look like? I mean, if they combine together, eventually if that happens, what could be the merge entity look like and what could be the key benefits for someone like a Minda? So, you know, as I said, Minda is already available. Uh, they already provide instrument hmm. clusters. Now, Precall will be adding, of course, their own uh, geographic as well as domestic reach to Minda Corp. And the combined entity will look much better. It is anyway a cleaner balance sheet. Sure. But, you know, I wanted to just toss this question to Prashant Kemka as well. Prashant, I don't know if you've uh, tracked this deal that has happened, but in general, how are you feeling about auto ancillaries? Yeah. The guys that have a global exposure are finding it a bit challenging, but the domestic piece is looking very strong strong. Uh, your thoughts? Certainly, it's uh, hard for me to uh, comment on individual companies, as you know, sure. and I have, to be very honest, not followed these very closely, this specific deal, to be any ways be able to comment. But you are right, because of the challenges in um, a lot of the auto angst companies do export to Europe. Um, and, and as you might know, some of the companies who reported over the last uh, few days have called out uh, the weakness in European demand, particularly. There is some de-stocking going on as well. So there are several undercurrents. One, the demand itself is a bit weaker. Secondly, the channel is de-stocking in Europe because the uncertainty around RM prices, raw material prices, and availability due to supply chain disruptions, both of them are uh, reduced compared to three to six months ago. So three to six months ago, you had channel building inventory in, uh, let's take Europe as an example. Um, so now the end demand is somewhat softer, but importantly also the channel is uh, destocking to normalize the inventory, which is resulting in weaker demand for the Indian suppliers. Mm. Guys, when is the last time you heard a hostile takeover? You guys remember yeah. which was the last time? Yeah. I'm when you guys were talking about uh, hostile. I mean this. Oh, uh, hostile. Not not a friendly Again, one. Again, you know, the, as, a as a I, I think it's too premature to say it's going to be hostile. Let's see. You know, this is just a first step. Whether they move ahead, whether Precall agrees for it, don't agree for it, whether they give up. So eh, there are too many moving parts. When was the last time there was a I hostile takeover? I think takeover. India has seen any hostile takeover, so to speak. I mean, uh, in, hints I, of it, right? Adani NDTV, for example, yeah. uh, was one maybe. LNT Mind Tree, uh, but that is some time ago, uh, which also had hints of it. Not like the US, yeah. of course, where mm -hmm. it is very brazen. Mm -hmm. But as a journalist, I mean, this is interesting stuff, interesting. right? Interesting. <laughs> Absolutely. Take right. over battle, right? Take over. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we'll take a quick break here uh, and uh, we'll focus on the auto sector, uh, which seems to be in top gear. Uh, the big gainers there and, uh, you know, how they fared. Prashant Khemka is with us as well. So, all of that in just a bit when we return. Welcome back. You're still watching the Editor's Roundtable and we're dissecting a lot of the 
companies, the stocks, the sectors of the week. But now I'm going to talk about the sector of the year so far. Of course, it's still just one month into the year. But auto stocks have been in top gear this year and have been some of the top gainers on the Nifty. So let's take a look at them and find out, you know, what's the, what the way forward could look like. Now, the biggest gainers in 2023 so far, Tata Motors up 15%, Bajaj Auto up 8%, M&M up 8% and Maruti up almost about 6 odd percent. So, so far, there's been a bit of a comeback in the auto space. Now, what are the triggers? The earnings this time were very strong. Most companies beat street estimates and there are earnings upgrades that have come in as well. The companies are gaining from a low base of FY22 as well as there is benefit of softening commodity prices and operating leverage as well. Now, here are the companies that have beaten street estimates in Q3. There's Tata Motors, m and Maruti and Bajaj Auto. For Tata Motors, as we know, it reported the first profit in the last two years. For m and it achieved the number one revenue market share for four consecutive quarters in a row. Maruti recorded margins above 9% for second two consecutive quarters and Bajaj Auto saw record high EBITDA in this quarter. So what's the way forward? Motilal Oswal put out a note where they said that the auto sector in their coverage universe saw 22% growth on the revenues and the top earnings upgrades in FY24 are expected from Tata Motors and Bajaj Auto. Tata Motors, they've upgraded earnings by 19% and Bajaj Auto by 6%. Uh, so Prashant, I wanted to toss that question to you as well. There's a bit of a recovery we're seeing after a long dry spell for the auto sector. Uh, has the time come to raise your uh, raise um, the allocation in your portfolio towards auto stocks? So see also raising is also relative right where you're starting from. So I think the team already has a fairly healthy allocation to the auto space and they continue, eva continue to evaluate though and I would uh, from what I understand they have increased the uh, allocation even in the last two three months so from here uh, i don't know how much room uh, because we don't go you know gung ho on any one particular sector at, at any given point in time in a very balanced portfolio but auto sector where the valuations are today and the prospects are uh, yes the team is finding several attractive opportunities in there all right uh, hi mr kemka you know sir uh, the cement space, that's been very, very exciting. And you all were early investors into uh, the Adani Group stocks. That's now the Adani Group. So that's Ambuja Cements. I think you all had a large chunk in there. The stock re-rated, but now it's back towards those uh, similar levels, 350-odd. Uh, what's your take on the stock from year on? And are you all continuing to hold on to the position, or have you all uh, lightened it a little bit? Nigel, in general, as you know, I can't talk about any individual stock. Any individual stock. To talk mm -hmm. about something, that is so volatile or sensitive of late is almost, uh, you know, obviously what is not possible is not possible, but I'll be, I'm sorry, would be, I hope you won't be able to talk about uh, a particular stock. But let's talk about the cement pack then on the whole. Uh, is, is it still looking up? India is going to be growing well, and cement is one of the proxies out there. The problem is in terms of pricing. Uh, your view from here on, on the cement space itself? Yeah, so overall, see, if... Uh, you believe that the economy is going to stay robust and all this infrastructure spending and the housing demand which has been uh, uh, you know strong uh, or decent I would say for the last uh, several quarters or years uh, then cement, cement demand is continuing cement is a very regional commodity very local uh, commodity too. so you have to analyze the demand supply more uh, from uh, not if not state to state then uh, region to region the north the east the west south and all which our uh, team obviously uh, has done and has accordingly um, you know selected uh, the investment ideas we are constructive on um, the overall cement space mm. in that we are ideas to invest yeah. there uh, Prashant, the, uh, the slow down, the, you said you alluded to, of course, one is the margin issue because of high inventory, etc. But you also alluded to some slowdown which is very visible, which is very clear. Uh, what will reverse that in your opinion? And if that is just starting, I mean, that may have some room to run, right? Uh, See, one, thing, one, thing, one thing I can think of, Prashant, is elections next year, right? Uh, so maybe spending ahead of elections, that puts more money in the hands of consumers. I don't know. Uh, your thoughts? Certainly, Prashant. No, very valid question. And when companies are asked this question um, by investors at large or ourselves, they sound a little more, you know, uh, like optimistic and hopeful rather than any concrete answer. Now, there could be that some of the reasons they're explaining or giving for the slowdown in the December quarter are uh, legitimate in that, see, Diwali was a little bit earlier this year than last year. Uh, they said Diwali fell in October versus the previous year. 
when it was in November. So some of the demand that was pulled forward into the September quarter. Uh, that's one of the reasons that they're giving. The wedding season was extremely light mm. in December this year. Several companies, particularly those who are exports, exposed, like jewelry companies and other uh, companies which are exposed to the wedding demand, have shown weaker demand in December, but they have called out a much sharper rebound in January, February, because the, there are a greater number of dates. There are approximately 40 days or so, 35 to 40 days in every wedding season from November to February. Uh, and they usually tend to be evenly split between uh, November, sure. December and December. This year it's been more in the next quarter. So if those things do come back, and even those that are not directly related to wedding, wedding is a very large industry in India and has an effect on several consumption-related sectors. So uh, that could itself uh, bring back some of that uh, growth channel inventory normalization uh, once it runs through uh, sure. uh, sectors can also bring back some of the demand okay folks it is that time of the day when we will wrap up our day and our week so uh, thanks a lot for watching and thanks for joining us through the course of this week we wrap up with editors roundtable have a great weekend see you again on monday prashant kemka thanks a lot for joining us as well